had no place to lay your head. You came to earth, perfect in love. You were obedient to death. Tell the world what you've done. Tell the world of the sun. You have risen from the grave. All creation shouts your name, and our tongues will confess your blood brought our righteousness. We will bow before your throne, and we'll worship you alone. is paid, we've been set free, your life was poured out to the grave, the wrath of God now satisfied, the love of God truly displayed, tell the world what you've done, tell the world of the sun, you have risen from the grave, oh Shouts your name And our tongues will confess Your blood bore our righteousness We will bow before your throne And we'll worship you alone You alone From death to life Reigning on high the empty tomb, the risen Lord And now we wait for your return To see the earth once more restored Tell the world what you've done Tell the world of the sun You have risen from the grave All creation shouts your name And our tongues will confess your blood Earned. 
Squandered all your precious gifts Distorted your great life Created idols for ourselves Trying to fill the hole inside How could we come Back to you How could we come Though we weren't deserved Today, time for another update regarding our expectations for the reopening of in-person services. Now, as always, in order to make sure that you are seeing the latest information from us, double check our website, barneysingleburn.com. If you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook or some other format, uh, it's worth checking our website that this is the latest video on the front page so that you know you've got the most up-to-date information. Now, it is currently Wednesday the 15th of September at about 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, and so that's when this is being filmed. I wanted to share with you our expectations for the next little while. While we don't have a concrete plan, simply because we don't have a concrete date yet, this is the mindset and the expectation that we're working with. The staff have decided that we're going to adopt a very uh, aggressive mindset. That is, we're going to seek to do the most we're allowed to do. In other words, the first opportunity we get, we'll be back in person. 
Now at the moment, what that is most likely to look like is this. The current roadmap that's been released by the New South Wales government is that at the point where the state reaches 70% fully vaccinated, that coming Monday, restrictions will be lifted such that that Sunday will be the first Sunday we'll be able to meet in person with those who are allowed to attend. Under the current roadmap, that seems to be people who are fully vaccinated. Now, the dates for that are a little bit uncertain because it depends upon those vaccination rates. However, it is looking likely that that will be sometime in, in late October. Now, we're hoping that at that point we'll be able to kick back off with our in-person services and likely to be in Ingleburn straight away, which will be very exciting to have the construction works completed and be able to gather with God's people once again, having been a while waiting for this building to be closed. So a couple of things for you to keep in mind. Firstly, again, make sure you check our website, barneysingleburn.com. As soon as we have a date, as soon as we have, we know for sure, right, this Sunday we're ready to go, whenever that may be, we'll post that very clearly, very visibly on our website. We're also trying to work out how many services and what time to run them and what sort of format they will have. So we'll make sure that information for that is clearly available as well. You may want to, at that point, when that comes and you finally get that date, reach out to people who, aren't, who are less connected to make sure that they find out as well. Now, in the meantime, uh, you may want to have a conversation with your GP about vaccination and where you stand and the decision you want to make about that. We will, of course, continue to provide online services, at least for the foreseeable future, to make sure that we're looking after everybody as best as we're able to. We're really excited about the possibility of being back in person again. I hope you are too. We're praying for that to happen soon and that we'll be able to do that in a way that is safe, but at the same time gives us that fellowship that so many of us have been yearning for. Now look, if you've got any questions, if you want to chat through it with somebody, if you've got concerns or you really just want to have a chin wag, please get in touch. Please get in touch. Any of the staff would love to chat with you. If you're in a small group, your leader would love to spend some time with you. Uh, make sure you reach out and let's be in touch that way. Day and welcome to Barney's Online. There's a great line in the movie you might have seen, The Incredibles. I want to play a little clip for you. Barney! What? Where's my super suit? What? Where is my super suit? Uh I am the greatest good you're ever going to get. Now look, it's a little bit of a laugh, isn't it? That idea that one person might be the greatest good the other person's ever going to get, right? We make jokes about the man who thinks he's God's gift to women or a woman who thinks she's God's gift to men. So it'll be very interesting for us today as we consider that we are God's gift to each other. Adam's going to open the scriptures for us in the first of our school holidays little break in our series, our regular programming, to encourage and exhort and challenge us with this idea that one of God's good gifts to us in the Christian life is each other. Let me pray as we begin our time together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have gifted us to each other. Thank you that in your grand plan, this is one of the main tools you use to teach, to encourage, to exhort, to strengthen. Father, as we reflect on that truth today, would you fill us with love for one another, a practical, a real, a deep love that seeks the good of those who are in the body with us. We commend this time to you in Jesus. Amen. Where 
Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, but walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, but a stain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name. As we come to hear God's word read and explained, let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for the Holy Scriptures, their precepts, promises, directions and light. In them may we learn of Christ, grasp his truth and have grace to follow in his steps. Amen. Hi, my name is Alison Wiltshire and I'm reading the Bible for you today. I am reading from 1 Peter chapter 4, starting from verse 1 and ending at verse 11. Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same understanding, because the one who suffers in the flesh is finished with sin, in order to live the remaining time in the flesh no longer for human desires, but for God's will. For there has already been enough time spent in doing what the Gentiles choose to do, carrying on in, on in unrestrained behaviour evil desires, drunkenness, orgies, carousing and lawless idolatry. They are surprised that you don't join them in the same flood of wild living and they slander you. They will give an account to the one who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason the gospel was also preached to those who are now dead, so that although they might be judged in the flesh according to human standards, they might live in the spirit according to God's standards. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober-minded for prayer. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, since love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Just as each one has received a gift, use it to serve others, 
as good stewards of the very grace of God. If anyone speaks, let it be as one who speaks God's words. If anyone serves, let it be from the strength God provides, so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. To him be the glory and the power for ever and ever. Amen. And this is the word of the Lord. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessings you give to us. We thank you most of all for the blessing of your Son who died for the forgiveness of our sins. As we understand, Father, that we are your redeemed and saved people, help us to understand that we are also your gift to each other. Help us to understand how we can serve and care and love one another all the more as we see the day approaching. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the year 1066, the Normans or French uh, conquered England. To commemorate this victory, they created what's called the Bayou Tapestry. Now, for those who don't know, a tapestry is basically a giant rug that you hang on the wall. It was commissioned somewhere towards the end of the 10th century and it depicts William the Conqueror's defeat of England. The tapestry portrays various events throughout uh, the conquest, but it culminates with the Battle of Hastings, which took place in the year 1066. Now, the tapestry is famous for a number of reasons, one of which is its length. It is 70 metres long and runs at a consistent height of around 50 centimetres. 70 metres long. That is almost the length of a football field. I know that if I, was try, if I would try to run the length of that, I would run out of breath long before I ran to the end. It is woven together with eight different warsteads. Now, a warstead is a type of yarn. And so from this yarn or from these various yarns, master weavers came together to create this piece of art. 
And there is the thing that amazes me about the Bayou Tapestry. This is a 70 long metre piece of art woven together through these different types of yarn to create this portrait of a great victory. I think of the individual skill and foresight required to create this piece of work that each person had to think about and sit down and plan what they were going to do to contribute to this piece of art. The amount of effort that was brought to the table just to make this happen, it is astounding. These men and women came together to proclaim the victory of their king. These people used their talents, they used their abilities, they used everything they had to work together to create and achieve their goal, to tell their story. Now today, we're going to look at how God is using us as his people to tell his story and what he has done for us in and through his son and what he is doing in and through the church. Now, as it is school holiday time and family holiday consists basically at this time of moving mess around the house, but at least we don't have the pressure of having to make children do schoolwork. And if you are one of those parents whose children find it fine to be working at home, could you please let the rest of us know and tell us your little secrets? But over the next three Sundays, we're just going to do a series of one-off talks. Joe and I have worked hard not to talk about, uh, to talk to each other about what we're doing. So these talks are not connected in any way that I know of. My talks are going to come from Philip Jensen's book, uh, By God's Work. Uh, by God's Word, sorry. And my topic today is how we are God's gift to each other. How do we work and serve together? In a lot of ways, this talk is a good practical follow-up to what we have heard just last week in Hebrews 13. The goal of today is to understand how we are a gift to each other. I'm basically using 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11 as my springboard. And the first thing to understand, uh, that we require to understand, that we are gifts to each other is to understand God's character as a giver. God's character is expressed through his forgiveness of us. Our God is a generous God. Our God is a giver. The word we use all the time is that God is gracious. His graciousness is a part of his character. It is a part of the way he just relates, both within himself and to us. And there are no clearer places that this can be seen than on the cross. We read in Ephesians, For you saved us by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is God's gift not from works, so no one can boast. Our salvation is the greatest piece of generosity God has or could have given any of us. That God became a man and died the death we deserved. It is a gift beyond recognition or beyond value or tabulating value. It is a gift we cannot repay except to say, thank you. Jesus died for the forgiveness of our sins. He died for my sin. He died for your sin. Out of his great generosity, he redeemed us. He's redeemed every single one of us. And at the very least, that makes us extremely valuable to God. But if God has redeemed and saved us for himself, he has also redeemed and saved us for each other. Paul says something very similar in Philippians. So then, my dearly loved and longed for brothers and sisters, my joy and my crown. We are God's gift to each other. We are meant to stay, understand each other as very precious gifts from God. And as such, this will cause us to live differently in the world. 
it should change the way we think. It changes our values. It changes our mind. It changes the way we look at the world. Christianity is a thinking religion. It should be thought through. It should be understood that as we look at the world, we will look at it differently. And that is why when Peter says we are to be sober-minded or of serious mind, Paul wants us to look at the world with this sober-minded thinking about reality, to look at what people are doing and understand the times we live in. I hope you're paying attention, as Alison read, that litany of unrighteous behaviour that characterises our world. And so Christians, we are to live differently to the world around us. This flows from what Joe was talking about last week in Hebrews 13. Uh, 13. God calls his people to be different, to be his people. The word serious has that idea of being sober-minded, of not being drunk, which is a complete departure from the way the world lists or the way the world behaves from the list above. I'll read what Peter says earlier. For there have already been... For there has already been enough time spent in doing what the Gentiles choose to do, carrying on in unrestrained behaviour, evil desires, drunkenness, orgies, carousing and lawless idolatry. That serious mind Peter is talking about, calls on, that Peter calls on us to have, is deliberately meant to separate us from the world. It is a contrast to the world. We live differently. We do not live the deport, ungodly lives of the world around us. Our world has given itself over to every kind of depravity, depravity represented in the drunkenness of the city of carousers and revelers who occupy the streets at night. In contrast, we are sober-minded, thinking clearly, understanding rightly, living in the world but never fully a part of it. Always looking at the world and having clear-headed, clear-minded thinking about it. Christianity does call for deep thought. It is a thinking man's religion. It is with this right way of thinking, with this clear mind, that we live differently with each other. And we need to realise with this right thinking, the way we live with each other, the way we live with the gift of each other that God has given us, that God has also given us many gifts and abilities to use, not in the worldly way, chasing after the passions and desires of the world, but chasing after God's desire, God's passions. And the gifts that God has given us it is for the sake of loving one another. This is where Peter says in 148, above all, maintain constant love for one another. Sincere love, since love covers over a multitude of sins. Love is one of those words I've come to love because of the way our world uses it. I'm constantly amazed by our society's ability to say love and mean, give me what I want, which is the exact opposite of love. Love is not a feeling or an emotion. It is not sex nor the hot flushes of new romance. Certainly a love can accompany those things, but love, true love, Christian love, is far more profound. Love is the desire to put the needs of the other person above your own. Love is the choice to act in the best interests of the other person. That is why Peter says love covers over, covers over a multitude of sins because he is aware that true love, love as God wants us to love, can be painful sometimes. It means sometimes putting up with the hurts and pains that other people cause us. Love is deliberate. 
It is considered. Love knows people have their faults, but chooses to care for them despite the difficulties. Love, like any good marriage, is hard work. But ultimately, love is always worth it. Peter gives us a practical example of the way we are to love one another. He says, we are to be hospitable towards each other. Now, this is the clearest example of, this is clearest in the example of opening our homes to one another. Opening our homes is a clear sign, an easy way of being hospitable. But that is not the only form of hospitality. It is calling one another on the phone. It is going for a coffee when we can or a meal with others when we're allowed. Hospitality makes time for one another. One of the simplest forms of hospitality that I think we fail at and don't realise we fail at has to do with our phones. Wait a second, I've got a message. Fascinating. Apparently, apparently there's a deal at Amazon. Just a second. Wow, 70% off golf clubs? Where's the card? Oh, dumb bank with that. What's that 16 numbers? I have trouble remembering my kids' birthdays. I can't do 16 numbers. Date, right, yep. Gee whiz, I'm getting old. All right, CCV number. Oh, dumb banks. Why did they make the number so small? If God wanted me to have eagle eyes, he would have given me wings. Right, send, right. Time out, error. What phone? Stop it. Oh, I'll give you time out. I'll put you underneath my foot. Excellent. Right, gone through. What? Delivery time? Six months? Do they have to dig the metal up themselves? Ah, stupid Amazon. Anyway, now where was I? Oh, yeah. When you sit down, learn to ignore your phone. If you get a message... Here is the good news. It will still be there when you finish. If you get a call, decline it. They can leave a message or you can call them back later. I remember being at McDonald's once and seeing a group of young adults all sitting around the table and every one of them had their phones in their hands. And they may or may not have been friends, I'm not sure. But instead of talking to each other, instead of sitting down and speaking to the person who was merely a metre away, they were ignoring each other and just had their phones in their hands, in their faces. They were ignoring the possibility of fellowship and friendship that was sitting right there at their table. They missed the opportunity all because of the shiny bauble, which is their phone. Every time you answer that message, every time you take that call, you are saying to the person opposite you, this device, what I am doing now is more important than you. If this is a struggle for you, turn the thing off. It is not going to die. Be hospitable. Put the person who is sitting across from you as the most important person in your life at that moment. Secondly, and this follows on from the hospitality, do not grumble about each other. People can be frustrating. I get it. The best answer to grumbling is prayer. Pray about the person. Grumbling will will only ever make you bitter. The person you are grumbling against most of the time will not hear it. So they won't be changed by it anyway. Most of the time, we don't want them to hear it. We wouldn't want them to hear it. So your grumbling only ever really affects you. So don't do it. And if this is a struggle, then I suggest you go and read Numbers 11.4. This is where uh, God is speaking to the Israelites 
in the wilderness. The riffraff among them, being the Israelites, had a strong craving for other food. The Israelites wept again and said, who will feed us meat? We remember the fresh, the free fish we ate in Egypt, along with the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions and garlics. But now our appetite is gone. There's nothing to look at but this manna. This is my go-to passage against grumbling. Because as a guy who likes his food, I can imagine myself easily being one of these Israelites, whining and whinging about God's provision for me. The church, the gathering of the saints, is God's provision to each other. We are one of the gifts that God has given each other. Don't whine, don't whinge about each other, is the very opposite of hospitality. It is the very opposite of love. Instead, seek what is good about the person. Seek what is great. Seek their gifts and pray about them and give thanks for them. God has given each of us different gifts and abilities for building up the church. So let us be thankful for each other's gifts and abilities. Let's praise each other's gifts and abilities because they are God's gift to the church. And that is what Peter goes on to say. Just as each one of you has received a gift, use it to serve others as good stewards of the very grace of God. If anyone speaks, let it be a as one who speaks God's word. If anyone serves, let it be from the strength God provides. Each of us has an ability. Each of us has a gift. The church is the gathering of God's people and it's the gathering of the good gifts that he has given us. None of us is perfect. We are all journeying through this life together, making mistakes, working, growing and God has all brought us here at this point in time to love one another, to build each other up. We all have gifts and abilities for the sake of each other. As I look around the church, I'm constantly amazed at the range of abilities people have. And so many of those abilities applied without others knowing it. There's Beryl Cummings, who's lovingly, who lovingly crochets all these wonderful pieces of clothing for people. I find crocheting and knitting an amazing skill, taking balls of yarn and weaving them into patterns that will serve others. Seeing a strand of yarn being spun together reminds me of dancers on a stage performing uh, a great performance, portraying a story. Like those dancers, each strand is spun and woven together to reach its masterpiece, to reach its goal. Like those strands of yarn, those warsteads, God has placed each person of Barney's here to serve the church. I think of John Mason's endless capacity to love people, his desire for people to know Jesus and be encouraged by them, his desire to care for people and let them know they are loved during this time. It has been wonderful to see. Or Leonie Sims, who just wants people to be encouraged, wants them to know that they are loved, how she calls people to see how they are and to care for them, simply lifts their spirits. I think of Andrew Armashaw and his boundless enthusiasm for life and how he just wants to spend time with people. It is infectious and it is delightful. There are the many mums, Nikki Ganjemi, Locke Gideon, who are new mums and Verity Groombridge, and the Blousers, who with their husbands serve the newest members of our church or newest members to be through so many sleepless nights. So many of those hours are unseen, but every one of them is vital. Then there are the men who put in so much time at the toilets, especially James Mayfield, who has put in many hours no one will ever see, doing all the paperwork to make the place compliant. There's Graham Brown, I know, who spent a fair bit of time during this lockdown getting an apartment ready for lease. That man's skills and tirelessness amaze me. 
There is Sue and the ladies who put in so much effort into morning tea. There is the scripture team who are just a bunch of unsung heroes. These ladies take the gospel to the coalface in the local schools, week in and week out when allowed. And they teach kids who will most likely never hear the gospel any other place but from those teachers who take them in there. There is Len, Kate, Abigail, Pat, Andrew helping with Kids Club and who can forget the silly scientist who apparently makes elephant's toothpaste explode. She holds a special place in my life and she, if she left, she would leave a hole in my heart, much like the hole in our kitchen where the toothpaste exploded. And that is just a small sample of the gifts and abilities that people bring to this church. I haven't mentioned the West clan who as a family put so much into the church and who were just astounding. They do so many things that the list is too long to put here. But thank you for all you do. I could go on and on with the things being done and the people I have seen working and serving at church. Each of you has great abilities and I'm amazed by all of you. There have been so many things that have blown me away and it is my great privilege to know you all. But here is my point. Each person, whether listed here or not, each of you is a gift of God to the church. Each of you have abilities and skills and each of your gifts have been given for the building of this church. Each person in the church is a warstead, is a strand of yarn that God is weaving together for this purpose, for the use of those gifts for his glory. Reading from verse 11, so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. As amazing as the Bayou Tapestry is, it has nothing of the victory tapestry God is weaving with us all here at Barney's. God is using our individual lives as warsteads to weave together into a victory banner to be displayed throughout Ingleburn, Macquarie Fields and Glenfield. And it is that victory, the victory of his son over death, that God wishes all people to see and glorify. God is the master weaver and each of you has been placed here because in his great love and mercy, he has and continues to weave us together, entwining our lives, bringing us closer so that we can display the great glories of God's salvation, both here in Ingleburn and to the ends of the world. We will have our ups, we will have our downs, we will have our victories, we will have our tough days. And we can share them all and we should share them all for the glory of Christ so that all people could know Jesus and the great thing he has done by giving us forgiveness of our sins and giving us the gift of each other. You matter. You matter to God so much that he sent his son to die for you in his grace, he has forgiven you. You matter to us as a part of this church. We need you and look forward to, long for the day when we can gather back together as God's people here at Barney's. And in so doing, God will continue to weave our lives together and display his great purpose, display his great victory, the declaration of his son's death and resurrection for the forgiveness of sins. And by his, by his grace, we all play a part in the declaration of that victory, be it here in Ingleburn or throughout the world. Let us give thanks to our God. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for what Jesus has done for us. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins that he has given us. We ask, Father, that we understand that we are redeemed people, redeemed for you, 
set apart for you and a gift to each other. We pray, Father, that we'll use the gifts and our abilities to build one another up, that we may love and serve each other and in so doing see your church grow and see your declaration, your victory tapestry spread and seen throughout Ingleburn and throughout all the world. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In our church family news, uh, really one main thing to let you know about. You might have seen in the last little while that we've had the, the uh, plan to come out of lockdown has been released and so we're starting to get a sense of what the next month or two might look like, in particular for a reopening of our in-person services and ministries. Now we don't have a plan as of yet because we don't have a concrete date but we have got a mindset that the staff have decided to adopt and that is to take uh, advantage of and make the most of every freedom and opportunity we get given to do the most that we can now in other words what that looks like is as soon as we're able to we want to restart in-person church services now the current roadmap, the current expectation, is that when New South Wales hits 70% of double vaccinated, fully vaccinated uh, adults in particular, then uh, those people who are fully vaccinated will no longer be under stay-at-home orders. So at that point, we anticipate reopening our in-person services for those people who are able to come while continuing our online services for those who are not. Now, in order to stay up to date with the latest, we always encourage you to check our website, barneysingleburn.com. 
As soon as we have information or a concrete plan, we will put it on that website. So if you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook or somewhere like that, and you're unsure if this really is the latest, maybe there's a newer video than this, then go and check there, barneysingleburn.com. As soon as we have a date for when we'll be reopening, we'll put it on there. And uh, look, our expectation right now is that we'll be able to reopen back at Ingleburn, which would be very exciting as well. So again, can I commend that to your prayers, uh, to your plans, and uh, look, hoping to be back in person again together soon. Let's spend some time in prayer now. It's time to pray. So I'm going to lead us first in the Lord's Prayer, and then I'm going to pray for a number of other matters uh, that might be relevant to our life uh, as, a, as a congregation. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So let me just pray for a few matters that are relevant to us. Father, we uh, pray for our governments at the moment. We thank you, Father, that in Australia we have good governments in the main. And we thank you for uh, the stable society that we have. But even with this virus, we are looking out after each other and things continue to work well. Father, we thank you for the work of our Prime Minister and our Federal Government. We thank you for the work of Gladys, uh, Gladys B um, and the work of the New South Wales Government. And we pray particularly for our leaders at this time that they might have wisdom not only to know how to deal well with this virus and how to keep people safe, but also to avoid the other sorts of damages that can happen when people are unemployed, uh, unable to pay their bills, unable to live um, in, in a way that makes sense to them. So, Father, we do pray for wisdom. We do pray for mercy, too, that you might relieve us of this virus, that we, the vaccinations, the public health programs might help us to combat this uh, virus and return to some degree of what we might call normal. We do pray for that soon. Father, we pray particularly for our neighbours and friends uh, for whom you know, the gospel, they don't know the gospel, so they don't know the hope that Jesus offers not only to defeat COVID, but to defeat death itself and to give us eternal life. Father, we pray for opportunities and boldness to talk about that message. Um, Please lead us to people who are open to consider the gospel. Father, we ask for mercy on our country. We've long walked away from you, and we pray, Father, that our country might come back to you. We pray for ourselves as a congregation, that even though we can't meet in the way that we hope, and you know, our ministers are frustrated that they can't do the things that they want, uh, Father, I just ask you would give us patience uh, to look beyond our current difficulties, our short-term sufferings, and look to the glory that you have promised us uh, in the Lord Jesus. We pray also, Father, for countries that aren't as fortunate as Australia, particularly in Africa, where such a small number of people are vaccinated and there are very few health facilities. We do ask, Father, that uh, you would have mercy on those nations and that the richer nations of the world, Father, we pray you would prompt them to be generous, uh, to look after our, uh, our brothers and uh, sisters, if you like, uh, who, who don't have the same benefits that we do. Father, we thank you for the news of the gospel that brings us new life, and we uh, thank you that we can be confident that your kingdom is coming, that your name will be glorified. And uh, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus, who gives us new life. Amen. It's found. He is my light, my.
my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter. of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin. God's gift to one another, as he displays in this wonderful tapestry that is the body of Christ, the victory that he has won over sin, over Satan, over death, the decisive victory that brings with it the people of God in God's place, living in harmony with God. Now, I hope that that's a truth that comforts you, that warms your heart, and that spurs you on to the love and good deeds that our God calls us to. God bless. The Lord, He is my shepherd. There's not that I need He hath dealt with all my sin all lay in pastures green I'll walk beside the peaceful waters so He 
friend use my life Keeps me on the straightest path Glory to God on high Though I walk through darkest valley I will feel no danger there For I know that you are with me Upon you I'll cast my cares Ha uh-huh. 